Welcome to Race Control. It's day five of leg six. I'm Jenny Tullock and it's guest day. So today joining us is Tim Kruger, race veteran, professional yachtsman and lecturer and Mark Chisnell, racing navigator who also writes a weekly blog about the Volvo Ocean Race for BNG. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Mark, we'll just start right off with you about today's strategy. It's basically decision day for the sailors, finally taking this right shift and tacking. But the question is, which side of the fleet would you rather be on? Would you rather be down in the right having legged it out, or would you rather be up further north, a bit to the left, like Abu Dhabi? Well, I think, Jenny, um, good morning. Um, <laughs> I think we just painted a little picture for everybody that'll it'll be easy to explain those choices and the options that face the sailors this morning. They've been chased up here by a low pressure system, by a front that they just managed to uh, keep them here ahead of. And they're coming into the influence of the South Atlantic High, which is centered off to their east. In the southern hemisphere, the wind rotates anti clockwise around a high pressure, so they've been sailing into a shifting northerly breeze. As they get further north, or northeast as they're sailing at the moment, that, wind, that breeze is going to go around further to the east, so they're going to be headed. That's what's been going on all the time, so their course will come more to face the east and further away from where they want to go. That's the reason they're going to have to tack when they get into the easterly. The other thing that's happening is that as they get further over that way to the northeast, the breeze is also going to strengthen. The further offshore they are, um, for the next section on, on starboard tack up towards the sea, generally the more breeze there is and the better angle they'll have to the right-hand side of the course to the east. So that's the reason for going further on the port tack that they're on at the moment. The reason for tacking immediately is that they're already headed more or less completely 90 degrees towards the direction that they want to go. We've just seen Team Alba Medica is the first to go, or at least they, they all had a few tacks, but they look like they might be holding this time, at least from what I can see. Uh, and as soon as you do that, you pop out in front because you're just going in the right direction. So it's a balance of do I, well, how far do I want to go in the wrong direction to get better breeze and better wind angle long term as they close on receipt. So from where they are, they've also got to kind of calculate, all right, we're going to tack, where are we going to head, where are we going to end up if we sail our fastest angle through the changing, shifting wind uh, that we're going to get over the next couple of days. Now that's the kind of job that you can't do in your head and you need something like um, BNG's Deckman software to calculate those, uh, the wind angles and the wind speeds and the wind directions for that, your particular boat right through this next two days. So those guys right now will be running a lot of iterations, a lot of different um, versions of this software to with different weather models to see where they think they're going to land come receive. And so they'd be looking at everybody else on the AIS and I think that's why we've seen so much tacking in the last few hours. So it's a balance of tactics and strategy. There's a lot of play here this morning. And it seems like, Tim, it seems like now that there is this balance of tactics and strategy, it's almost two games. There's the big picture offshore navigation that's always happen and always necessary. And there is this really tight racing, really close, more tactical game. How much pressure do you think that puts on the crews uh, mentally and in the decision making to actually have to continue to play the big picture with such tight, close racing going on? I mean, the pressure on the on the boys and the girls is, is enormous. You know, it's normally in, in offshore racing or in ocean racing, it's more like a strategic game. But this is now completely different because it's more tactical. The guys, they see each other. So they see each other on the AIS and um, they have to also react constantly. And uh, it, it's really, it's one design racing at its best. And um, let's say that way, it's, it's great for us and for the audience to see and to watch, but it's, it's really hard on them. Um, but, you know, great to watch, definitely, and, and, and a fun, uh, very enjoyable to, to follow it. But it's, it's really tough. It's, it's tough, tough, tough. You can see that in all the footage. And, um, well, it's, it's, it's great. It comes across um, as a fantastic race. Um, in the speed gains, we've been talking about speed duels, how it's just little minute differences that make the difference, whether it's actually changing sails or just changing a little bit of degree of heading. Mark, can you talk to us a bit about how they're able to measure that on board, how they're able to measure the gains or losses they might be making, even just in a straight line with the sales, same sail configuration? Right, well, they've got a, a very comprehensive instrument package from BNG on the boat that gives them several different ways of actually measuring those things. Uh, the global scale, obviously, they get the information on board from the position report every three hours, and that's, in the old days, that's all you used to get, and that's one of the reasons why the pressure has increased, because now they, they have radar. Again, they've always had radar, but radar gets more accurate, it gets more sophisticated all the time, and its ability to track a boat at 30 miles away uh, is there now, and more importantly, I think in this race, specifically in this race, the AIS. 
as we've mentioned a couple of times already, automatic identification system, it allows them to track another boat within 10 miles from them extremely accurately all the time. So it's just like basically sailing beside someone up to a 10 mile range. So that's really the key measurement, I think, is, is generally in yacht racing. We always compare ourselves to how the other guy closest to us is doing. Now, if you can't see anyone, if you're, you've taken a uh, flyer, say a flyer, but you've taken a tactical move that um, may or may not come off and you're out there in the ocean on your own, then you have to come back to relying on the instrument system and its uh, measurements that it's got for you. So you've got boat speed, you've got uh, wind sensors on board that tell you the wind direction, the wind angle, and you have a model in the boat's computer of how you think you should be doing in those conditions. Now, that allows you to compare very accurately against your current performance, against your previous performances. So you, you collect kind of a set of your best performances at different wind angles and wind speeds. And that's a thing called a polar table. That sits in the boat's computers and it allows you to compare your current performance to that historic best performance in the past. So there's different ways of doing it and different ones of them um, work at different times, depending on how many people there are around you. Okay, so let's go forward now with, the, the, we're talking about performance of each boat, how you can measure your own performance and compare that. Um, but I want you to measure the performance of the boats right now. So Tim, with you, let's go with the three left boats, Alvi Medica, Abu Dhabi, and Team SCA. Um, compare the performance of those three and maybe place a bet on who you would take out of those three to win this leg. Well, first of all, it's fantastic to see that the girls are performing so well and that they are really with a pack and really with all the other boats together. And they, they have also the ability to push as hard as the other guys, despite the problems they just recently had with their runner winch blowing up. But uh, it's really hard to see uh, or to make a bet on who comes out uh, best because uh, the three left boats, you know, we're, we're awaiting a right-hand shift and... Um, it can go well, it can go pear shaped but it's it's great to see that the racing is so close and uh, it's just, they're so close to, together, it can go either way and uh, Alimedica has teched first, so we see how this ends up, but uh, it's it's very, uh, it's very tight racing and it's, yeah, it's bloody, bloody tough. So it's, it's hard to make a judgment um, on who comes out best and who comes out first because there are also some local interferences with the, with the clouds and uh, it will go back and forth. The thing is that now that uh, they're, they're getting into the trades, it will be it will be tough. You know, you, you've got to be you got to be fast. You've got to push, 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 and uh, it will be quite stable conditions in the trade winds. And uh, it will be a, a drag race at least till the equator, till they come to the doldrums, and uh, uh, that will show who's quick, who's quick under which conditions. And uh, yeah. Dragging on, pushing hard. Well, it's, 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 we'll let you take on the, the, the three right boats then, Mark. Well, it's, it's, the shift is one of those things that I, I read an email from Ian Walker last night saying there's a lot of clouds around. So it's one of those things that when you look at it on the weather map, it's a nice, even curve of, of the wind shifting from the north to the northeast to the east. You sail into the curve and, and the, the deck man calculates the right moment to tack. However, when you're actually on the water, the reality of it is generally you'll get hit by a cloud. It, it's very rarely smooth, uh, even changes. There's going to be a discrete change at some point. There's going to be a, a cloud come across a wind line. There's going to be a big bang, you know, and the breeze is going to go 20 degrees. And kind of that's the moment um, when you know you really, really do need to be on the other tack. Now, um, seeing that moment, it, it could also happen for different boats because we, we're looking at uh, Brunel now, they're quite a way separated down to, towards the southeast compared to uh, Abu Dhabi and Team Alba Medica, so they're, they're well far enough away to get a completely different cloud system to the boats okay, women so the main thing to trim the main sail So is it's hard for me sheet, sitting here right? to say, you know, well I think, uh... you know, if Brunel get a good cloud right now, they could tack and cross everybody. Um, if they don't, uh, you know, if the, if the breeze shifts first for the guys to win with, then they're going to have the best opportunity. So. Really, it, from this distance, is extremely hard to make a judgment. I'm a little bit like Tim. I'm a conservative tactical sailor, a little bit like we've seen Ian Walker approach this whole race. You know, I, I kind of like to be in the middle. Um, I don't see any good reason to be on an edge because um, the edges is where the scary stuff happens. Mm -hmm. If I had to pick an edge, I would pick the eastern side. Just, just looking at the weather map right now, there's quite a big hole to the east of them. And the guys that go first, although they've got less distance to sail, I think they're going to be in less pressure most of the way. So if, if it was me, I'd probably be looking for a, a middle to right-hand side, middle to eastern side of the fleet. 
Okay, let's talk now, Tim, about Dongfang Race Team. You told us a, you had an interesting story about a water maker, but they've basically been plagued sort of by problems throughout this race. Obviously, a broken mast on the last leg. A water maker meant they were pumping emergency water for the last couple of days until the fix. How much does that affect a team? How do you think they're powering through? Are they doing well enough with these breakages? I mean, first of all, it's fantastic to see how they have... Uh, dealt with all the problems they had. I mean, a broken mass in the Southern Ocean and then come back um, with getting it just sorted, just being on the on the dotted line and being able to restart and also do the uh, the import races. I mean, it's, it's, it's bloody hard if you have problems like that. And uh, especially now on this leg, in the beginning, the problems they had with a water maker in a, on a leg where you will sail into the doldrums, where it will get hotter by the day and where you definitely need the water. I mean, you need the water anyways, because all the foods prepared with that water that it comes from the desalinator. Um, lucky that they got it sorted. And these guys, they were, they were pumping manually, the water maker. And uh, I remember we had a problem like that in the race uh, I did on Intrum in 93-94. Um, we had a broken water maker or one of the membranes broke in, uh, on a southern, southern Ocean leg. And uh, that, that, then we couldn't st uh, sit on deck and pump the, the water maker manually. So my, uh, my fellow crew member of that time, Mr. Knut Frostad, head of Volvo Ocean Race nowadays, um, he fitted the uh, water maker, the manual water maker, into the little toilet room we had there. So when you were in the toilet and uh, nicely resting on the bowl, you could... Uh, uh, pump while you are sitting there and uh, uh, create some additional uh, bonus for the society on board. So it was quite a smart move. And uh, but I can tell you, using these manual water makers, it's a tough grind. Uh, it's not that much water coming out of that. And sometimes when you were doing that, you had the feeling that uh, uh, when you use the water maker, the sweat you create by pumping the water maker, the manual water maker. That's exactly exactly what you get out of it in terms of fresh water. So lucky for the guys that, that got it sorted. I take my hat off for them. Good job. It holds. Okay, let's wrap it up now. Um, I'm going to make you guys place your bets. Mark, who do you bet just on this leg, um, if you could put your money on anyone, would win this leg? <laughs> I, I wouldn't go with anyone other than uh, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing just because uh, there's a lot of bricks on <laughs> So I've kind of got that hometown thing going, and also they're the overall leaders, so why not back the guys that are already winning? Okay, Tim, yourself? Well, really, I mean, <clears throat> I, would, I would like to route for, for Bauer, but he, because he had some bad luck in the, in the past the legs, guys. and uh, it's, it will be great for him to come through and push through. It will be fantastic, and he's the most Eastern vote. So when the shift comes and when they hit the trade wins, he's got a bit of leverage, so he can he can make it. But I I will also uh, not uh, take basically Abu Dhabi Racing out of uh, out of uh, sight because Ian uh, have been very good during the during the race so far and they've been pushing hard. So I bet between the two of them, but sometimes it's hard because they are on on either corner, one in the west, one in the in the east. Sometimes it's better to, to go through the middle. So it's, it's basically a hard call. Um, I would love to see Bauer win that leg. I'm going to throw two dark horses out there. There's Albi Medica, who's the hometown finishing heroes. If they were to win into Newport, it would mean the world to them. And then also Team SCA has actually done the last part of this leg and a transatlantic they did last year, delivering the boat to Newport. They then sailed the last part of this leg just so that they'd have those extra miles. So we've got at least those four, but obviously the other two, Dongfang and Matfrey, in the mix. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, great to thank have you. you. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for joining us as well. We're off for the Inside Track this weekend, but you can follow along on the tracker, the app, and of course online. And we'll see you Monday for the next Inside Track.